Hello and welcome to uh, Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 196, Endgame, discussing the various ways board games end. I'm Sean, your host, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record this show live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and we'd love you to join us if you can. Now, we're starting off the new year 2023. Happy New Year to everyone out there with a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who's looking for a discussion on game end mechanisms. After that, we dive into the pile of obligation to review not one, but two games. Boba Mahjong, a two-player set collection game, and Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, a dice drafting game in the Valeria universe. We wrap up with a busy week in review where I got in some New Year's gaming and we totally didn't have a Sean Con. Before all that, though, let's see what our fans had to say this last week. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Well, let's start off with a comment from Andre that ties in well with part of our 22, 2022 look back <laughs> from last episode. Your review of Tales from the Loop board game was spot on. We tried a five-player game, and it was a disaster. After five hours of trying, we finally gave up. A very poor rulebook with contradictions and amb ambiguities and an impossible start here scenario left us soured and frustrated. I'll be looking to sell my copy. Well, Andre, I wish I could say, just try again. You'll figure it out. It gets better with more plays. Just go online to Board Game Geek and check for rule clarifications. But even that's not going to help, at least at five players. Now, if you are willing to give it one more go before you pass the game on to someone else, uh, maybe you don't want to point them to our review before you give it to them. Um, <laughs> you might want to try the light fantastic scenario that actually removes a whole bunch of the mechanics from the first part of the game. And just as you're wandering on the map and the biggest thing is play with three players, exactly three players. Once we got the game down to three players, we actually did have some fun with this game. But honestly, even at that player count, it's not a game that's going to be for everyone. The dice are still frustrating. You fail more often than you succeed. And I, I, I totally understand it. If you or your group don't want to try to work to find the fun. Absolutely. Well, sticking with things related to our last episode, Patrick shared his holiday gaming tradition. My holiday gaming tradition is my annual nerd year's Eve party with like friends and family. Typically lighter party games, and thanks to the heads up about Plan B games, I just <laughs> picked up promos for Bees, Reef, and Azul. Uh, sounds like a great time, Patrick. Um, I miss our big gaming in the New Year party. Uh, this year it was just the four of us, me, Dan, and the kids. And while we had a good time and did get in some gaming, it's just not the same as having a house full of gamers. Maybe next year we can get back to that. And also, you're welcome about the Plan B deal. Um, I'm sorry to see Plan B go, but their closing deals were great. I actually ended up with the Reef promo under the tree this year because of that sale. Well, here's three quick ones that I don't really think need a reply. Patrick Marino commented on our Mounds of Molehills unboxing to say, Great video, Mo. Pickpocket Press RPG videos commented on our topic of games from our childhood we still play with Talisman, yes! And finally, patron of the show, Brian Sheen, commented on our RPG in a box list with, I was very happy to be gifted a few of these for Christmas. Well, thanks, Patrick, Brian, and Pickpocket Press for the positive feedback. Now, on a less positive note, Alex has a comment about our Quacks of Quedlinburg review that we think is worth sharing. He says, I've read some things about this game and was very happy when someone bought me a copy. Well... I was happy for about 20 minutes. I am colorblind and sometimes have problems with counters, but this game was a whole new level. I can best describe its color clash as garish. It caused me anxiety, nausea, and gave me a migraine. I didn't get much further than punching the pieces and glancing at, at the rules. It may well be a fabulous game, but I won't find out via personal experience and would advise anyone else with colorblindness or other color sensitive conditions to ask to see a test copy before buying. Very sad, really, as I expect. It might be a, a bit of a gem. Uh, it's definitely a gem, I will say that. Uh, well, thank you so much, Alex, for pointing this out. 
Now, both Sean and I, Deanna as well, don't suffer from any color blindness, uh, though I do have my own slew of vision problems, as does Deanna. This is also the first time I've actually heard a complaint like this about quacks, which sounds like it may be more of a visual processing issue, which is something my daughter deals with over a color based one. Like, I don't know if it's color blindness. I think it might be something else. Um, but either way, this is a very valid concern. And I think your suggestion of checking out a test copy is a fantastic one. Or at least check the images online, go to Board Game Geek or somewhere where you can flip through multiple images of the game to see if this could be a problem for you. Yes, uh, we, I actually went, went and did a little dig, deep, digger, deep, uh, deeper digging on this. Uh, the accessibility teardown from Meeple Like Us uh, shows that it does mostly pass the colorblindness test. All the pieces work. Uh, there is some, however, jumbledness when it comes to tracking what order players are in on the board. So the actual, you know, uh, player tokens on the board certainly can become mm -hmm. lost. Uh, but they do note that these, it is definitely a confusing color palette, which goes right. towards the, the potential processing. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback by commenting on our posts, emailing mo at tabletopbellhop.com, sending us a message, or tagging us on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, your game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from patron of the show, Dr. Donna Bowman, our very own Patch the Paladin. And Donna writes, your scythe review was terrific. It got me thinking about possible Ask the Bellhop question. What are the pros and cons of various end of game rules? Things like everybody gets another turn, the round completes back to start player, or the game ends immediately. Are there any interesting, creative, or unusual end of game rules you've run across? Well, thank you so much for the question, Donna, and of course, for being a patron of our show. You too could become one of our awesome Patreon patrons by heading to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tipping your bellhop. So it's been a while since we've done a non-game recommendation topic, and I wanted to get back to doing those a little more often. And when looking for such a topic, I ran into this question from Donna and thought it sounded like a fun topic. Now, what's not obvious from Donna's question is exactly what prompted this in the first place. Like they do mention the Scythe review, and that is the fact that Scythe has a very unique end game mechanism that is one of the big points of contention um, with fans and detractors of the game. Both sides have opinions on this one. Now, this mechanism is actually one of the things that turned me off the game my first experience with it, which anyone who watched our review knows that I did not enjoy the game at all until giving it a second chance. So inside, you earn stars for competing, a, completing a wide variety of objectives, building your mecha, building, winning battles, getting to the end of the popularity track, etc. The game ends immediately when any player earns their sixth star. This can happen even in the middle of a player's turn. You mm -hmm. don't even finish the full turn. You just complete the action that earned the star, and it's done. That combined with the fact it's not unusual for a player to earn more than one star in a turn. And I know I have personally managed to earn three in one turn, which can lead to the game ending very abruptly and way earlier than players plan on. I've even accidentally ended a game by doing one action that would have led to a ton of points on my second action. And when doing that first action, I ended up getting a star and the game ended and I never got to take the second action. And I know other people have messed up that rule many times and it forgot about it and counted on it to, you know, get them a big points in the last move of the game. In short, the way a game ends can have a powerful influence over the way the game is played with mm -hmm. players adapting strategy to maximize their score and or minimize opponents when it gets down to the approaching end. Scythe isn't the only game I played where I was frustrated by the end game condition, though. Donna mentions three of the main ways games end. The end trigger is met, and then one of these three things happens. The game ends at the end of the turn. You finish that player's turn. At the end of that player's turn, that's it. No one gets to go again. You total up the points or do whatever you do at the end of the game. Someone wins the race. You finish out the round with every player getting an equal number of turns, or the game goes one additional round after that. Now, I would add another common one to that, and that's the everyone else gets one more turn and it doesn't matter the round order. You're not going to first player, it's just everyone else gets one turn. Now, while these all sound deceptively similar, 
in a highly competitive games, one turn can be the difference between first and last place, completing yep. your master stroke or flopping. Now, I know a lot of people that hate the fact that some games allow different players to get an uneven amount of turns. A lot of these players are players who take the competition of a game very seriously and are all about winning and feel that if everyone did not get the same chance, take the same number of actions, it's not fair to the players who got less. For whatever reason, maybe because I don't take games all that seriously, like, yes, I've said it before, I play to win, but I don't really care if I win or lose. That never bothered me. But I know it's something that bugs Deanna in games where it applies. Now, one hopes that the designers have playtested and chosen their particular endgame mechanism with careful thought. And similarly, as a player, you should carefully pay attention to the mechanism and timing. But sometimes you just get caught. Yeah. So looking at these four main types, I think my favorite of these is everyone gets one more turn. What I like most is this will often cause players to be worried about ending the game and it kind of extends the game. And I like engine builder games, right? That's the type of game I like. And I always love to be able to run my engine that one more time. And I'm always worried about trying to end things too early. And you don't want to give that advantage of one more turn to everyone else. So you worry about ending it. This works best to me in high scoring engine building games where you're earning a lot of points in that final turn where, you know, every game turn you're earning two, you're earning four, you're ending 20, you're ending 30. And then the last couple turns of the game, you're ending like 130 points. Um, German railroads or Russian railroads are, is a great example of a game like this where giving one player just one more action could be a huge swing in the points. Now this one can punish the player who finished first and could potentially let start player have an advantage over others. Now, second for me would the, be play one more round. But for some reason, this feels less tactical. I don't know. It just, it, it feels boring. Um, it just, hey, we, we, okay, we're done. Now everyone gets one more turn to try to earn points. This tends to happen in race games where the game ends at a certain point and gives everyone a chance to go past that point, right? So yes, the, the goal to end the game is 10, but it's actually the player who mo with the most points wins. Catan's an example, or more recently, one we play a lot more often is Space Space, where yes, the goal's 40. When someone hits 40, the game's going to end, and we go around the table one more time, but the final scores might be in the 50s and 60s by the time it all goes around. But like to me, I don't know. I, f I find that uninteresting compared to the other types, but it's still, I, I prefer it than some of the others. But again, that's very personal. But you have to be ready not only to end the game, but put in that little bit more effort to extend past the finish line mm -hmm. and not run out of steam after ending while everyone else yes. surges past. Now, my next one would be finishing out the round. Um, this is lower than the others just because I've been in the position where it stinks being the person who's already gone that round. And then someone after you ends the game and you don't get to go again when you're planning on it. You're like, I got my handful of cards. I got two more cards to play. I'm good to go. You go. Okay, you go. Deanna goes. Oh, the game ends. And well, first players, you know, before me. So I don't get to go. And it's just like, oh, I hate that one. That is the one I don't like, especially if you don't see the end game trigger coming. Right. Well, it's easy to say you should be watching the other players. The fact is it's, we all get caught up in our own play from time to time, especially if we're not already proficient mm -hmm. at the game and able to play our own part a little more automatically while focusing on the other players' strategies. Yeah. And then the last one, of course, is at the end of the turn, right? I, if the player finishes out their thing, if they end of the game, the game ends. Uh, this one, I get Catan flashbacks. We played a lot of Catan games um, over one particular summer or a couple years there, and I don't know how many times... I had a plan and I was one move away from making the big move when someone claimed the longest road, then tossed down two victory point cards, somehow got four points in one turn, claimed the win before I got to actually make my move. And here I am ending with like three points at the end of the game when they have 10. Yeah, I have to say that while I'm generally not a big take that player and I'm not super competitive at all, I do perhaps perversely love this <laughs> particular game ending. Fair. It doesn't even benefit me all that much, generally. I'm not the greatest planner, but the feeling of accomplishment when you both end and win in a unified yeah. manner can really kind of bring it all together. I, I guess it's got to be, it's happened to me more often than I pulled it off. It's probably my bias there. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a certain player we all play with that is really good at pulling that off, especially in Catan. 
Now, the thing is, with all of these, I think they all have their place in the right game. And I've got to say, I don't envy any game designer who's at that point trying to pick which one of these works for their game. Similarly, I don't envy them for coming up with that end game trigger is. Like, how did Jamie decide Scythe ends at six stars and not seven or five? Why does Catan go to 10 and not 11? Or why does 10 scoring cards mean the end of a game in Boba Mejong when the other player might only have two? Though I got to say, we're talking about two different things here. And actually, when working on this particular podcast episode, I kept getting distracted by endgame triggers as opposed to endgame mechanisms. I think the topic of endgame triggers is an awesome one and one I think I want to get into, especially Sean did the same thing. He went into the show notes added a bunch of games, and I'm like, yeah, but those aren't end games. Those are what trigger the end game. They're two different things. But you know what? We're not going to dive into that now. That'll be another topic, perhaps a follow-up next week. We'll see. All right, so another part of Donna's question that we haven't tackled yet is if there are any interesting, creative, or unusual end-of-game rules that you run across. All right, the first one that popped into my head and one I actually really enjoy, though, again, this is one, depending on what end of the, what end of it you're on, you may love or hate, and that is Clank. In Clank, you're rushing into a dungeon, grabbing artifacts and getting out, also defeating monsters, collecting cards. But what happens is the first player that gets out starts triggering an end game. It doesn't quite end there. What happens is a countdown timer starts. And players have, I think it's four turns, I didn't double check the rules on Clank before this, to also get out. And if they don't, they die. Also, anytime that player's turn comes up, the dragon attacks. So there's an added incentive of players possibly getting knocked out. So the game could end any time. And once it ends, you've got that four more rounds to get out which may or may not be enough. And then it, of course, speeds up if a second player escapes. Now on both their turns, the dragon attacks. And I think that one's really unique and works fantastic for that game. But I wouldn't want that in Scythe or Space Base. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Clank is a fantastic one. Uh, and, and it's one of those ones that can hurt, uh, hurt or help you. Uh, yes. It's real easy to be the first one out. But if the players still in the dungeon have timed it right... They can hit a couple of big scores and sneak out or at least get up above the ground yep. so that they are pulled out by the the uh, the citizens and survive to, to count their score. Yeah. Yeah, we always joked about how if you died above ground, they saw you, so they make a statue of you and you could still win because you live, <laughs> live on in fame. Right. Now... Another one that I, that I think is unique, and it's weird because it combines with this. So, so there's a bunch of games out there that have standard ending me mechanisms like we already talked about, right? Whether it's one around the table or end of the turn, that doesn't matter. They have those, but then there's some other condition that can prematurely end the game. These games typically would be normal except for that. So an example of this is the army track in Seven Wonders Duel. If you manage to push it all the way to the opponent's end, you win. Twilight Struggle, a kind of similar one where you have a DEFCON track that moves up and down. But if you ever hit the top level, and I can't remember what's worse, one or five or whatever it is, uh, there's nuclear war. You both lose. You blew up the planet. Sorry. Um, Netrunner. Netrunner normally is the first player to hit seven objective points wins and the game ends, right? Typical above. But then the hacker player has their own end condition where if they take enough net and meat damage, they're out of the game. And similarly, the corporate player has a totally different one that's if their deck ever runs out. So if the corporation runs out of resources, they lose the game. Almost every single Lord of the Rings game has done this differently, but there's some form of capture or destroy the ring video, video condition, sorry, victory condition that stacks on top of some other game system. And I think Lord of the Rings is a fascinating one to look at for that because every game does it a little different. Sometimes it's get the ring to Mordor and the Fellowship wins. Other times it's recapture the ring another time. And then what you do is you compare it to War of the Ring is a big war game. Um, what's the um, Lord of the Rings? The confrontation is basically kind of like Stratego. Um, the Lord of the Rings co-op game is you versus the AI. And if Sauron hits you, he captures the ring. And it's neat because you have your own goals. But then there's another thing that's in there that can totally change the way the game ends 
Yeah, the Lord of the Rings. It's sort of some of it depends on you know which age of the ring you're in. Where where yes. is the ring that at that particular time <laughs> is going to determine that particular rings and games. Uh, but it's so interesting that these games all have this sort of race condition to the end, but all different or in some cases multiple different race conditions yeah. to that end. Yeah, exactly. And then, like I said, the, the most fascinating thing is like the War of the Rings and Area Control game, Seven Wonders is an engine building game, right? But they still have that one mechanism that, that the game can end like this if you mess up. You got to pay attention. And the one we haven't mentioned so far is Last Man Standing. This goes back to Saurian Trouble, but also modern games like King of Tokyo or Red Dragon Inn. Now, while player elimination isn't as popular as it used to be, with the right quick enough game, I still enjoy it and I still think it works. And the thing to note here as far as end game is, is the game is going to end at different times for different players. One player is going to get eliminated first and probably have a much shorter game experience than the last player to be eliminated. And I think this is very cool because the play length shifts. Like, like some players play for way longer than others, what does that player who was eliminated do? And that's where, where modern games tend to at least give that player something to do if they're eliminated. But like, if you think back to those old games, how many times are you playing with your siblings or your friends and, you know, you're eliminated first, you go play something else. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a whole theme of, uh, you know, either both miss a turn, get eliminated, uh, all those mechanics that really took away uh, player agency. Uh, mm -hmm. essentially and and made get, turned you into a from a player into a spectator yes. uh, which is thankfully something that has mostly gone away in the majority of games although it still exists in certain uh, certain uh, games now another one i thought of that's similar to this but not the same is when you can't make any more moves this seems to be most common in abstract strategy games multiplayer abstract strategy games uh, the game that made me think of this is, hey, that's my fish. Uh, what happens in that game is you can your penguins can be pinned so you can no longer move. So then your game is done, but everyone else keeps playing. Um, I cannot find the name of it. I don't know if Jerry listens to the show, but if he does, hey, Jerry, give me a shout out. What was the frog based game you taught me at Queen City Conquest with the like ceramic frogs? Because that was a similar one. You were le leaping over leaping or uh, leaping onto lily pads that's where not leaping pads lily pads and you could cut someone off by cutting away their their way out and then another example um was was oh, there's another example i'm drawing a blank again but games where you can cut each other off um the battle sheep that's the other one battle sheep is another one where you're, you're moving your stacks of sheep and you can eventually pin someone in in those your game could end as far as you can't take any more moves and often the last player gets to make a ton of moves where everyone else just has to sit and watch as they clear out the board. Um, another example is Tiny Towns. That's a modern one where a bingo game where everyone's using the same input. And if you did poorly, if you run out of space on your board, you're done. Now, where this is completely different from player elimination is you're not eliminated. You can still win the game if you run out of moves. And that's happened to me many times in, hey, that's my fish. Like, yeah, you eliminated me and I can't move anymore, but I got all the three fish. You're just collecting all those ones at the end. It doesn't matter that you're going to get to collect more tiles. I've got the more powerful ones. Yeah. And then I was thinking about um, tapestry. I think tapestry also fits in that because you choose when to switch eras. It's one of the most unique things in that game is there are four eras of the game and it's your choice when to switch. Now, generally you do it when you're out of resources, but you can do it at any time. Well, some player has to end the game first. And for them, they're done. They're they're literally just watching. Now, thankfully, the game's engaging enough. I think it's fun to watch the other players finish, especially if you figured out your your last score and people are creeping up on you. But if you finish and you're in last, there's no fun at the end of Tapestry. I, and I have to say, at least my experience in Tapestry is I've usually finished because everyone else has got a better engine of some sort and they're just, they're already in front of me and I just have run out yes. of things to get score. Um, and, and in one way, that's kind of the, the nice way, nice reason to play it on BGA because you don't have to see everyone surging <laughs> ahead and crushing your score until the, until you see the final totals at the very end. Um, uh, yeah, Tapestry, Tapestry is one where it definitely fits um 
and and thankfully in person I haven't had that happen, but on yeah. on BGA I have had it where it's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm done, and oh you guys aren't even co- oh this is going to be an ugly yeah. score. <laughs> Another example that be Arnak. Mm-hmm. I've definitely seen it in Arnak because any basically any game where you keep taking actions until you pass, this can happen on that last round. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Arnak. The, I remember the first time I played Arnak. That's exactly um, what I was thinking. I was, of. You know, I, I had no, I didn't understand it was an engine builder. I kept thinking of it as a deck builder, uh, yeah. and and I just didn't have, I hadn't built an engine to get me the actions to do anything. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, oh well, I, I can't do anything. You guys have like, you guys just keep at it. Have fun. <laughs> Oh. All right, those are the ones I noted down. Now, again, we weren't looking, we're, we're not looking for end game triggers. So when I first looked at this, I had all kinds of other games on here, like Betrayal of House in the Hill, where you never know when it's going to end because you never know what the haunt's going to be. But then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, wait, no, the end is always immediate. Whenever you accomplish whatever that goal is on the final haunt, which could be escape the house, uh, find the cat, explore the whole house, or kill the werewolf, the actual end game mechanic is the game ends when you accomplish your goal. So I was trying to think of other ones and I got to say, I'm sure they're out there. That's all that came to mind for me. So what I got out of this is, and I had gone down the wrong direction. I had been researching this. I, I had been thinking triggers uh, and, and, you know, and not what comes after the trigger, you know, how many, right. the, the play after. So uh, what I was really thinking about is what is it that makes a good ending? Uh, what, what differentiates the, the good from the bad. And we've talked a little bit about what we did like and what we didn't mm-hmm. like. Um, and I think the three things that come up for me that really sort of define the idea for me is tension, immersion, and player agency. Mm-hmm. And those are the, the three things that kind of have a, a massive effect in varying levels, depending on which of those you're looking at. You know, you want to have that tension and the feeling of urgency and, and eagerness what you don't know if you're going to win and if you're going to lose what's going to happen um the immersion in the game and you know what whether or not you feel like you're in it or you've checked out and you're moving on yeah uh and then that player agency you know what how much of it is up to you and how much of it the game has determined um yeah. so no i totally agree on those though so i i would argue the tension isn't always good and that's where this whole thing really depends on the game If you were playing a light, casual game, you don't want that tension at the end. You don't want to be worried about when the game was going to end. You just want to keep playing until it's done and then write up your score and then congratulate the players and move on. Um, Immersion, though, definitely, right? Like having, knowing Scythe. So going back to our original example of Scythe, which, again, is a little bit more about endgame triggers than ending, but it's all about that it can end in the middle of your turn is what really sticks out to Scythe. Well, that adds such a level of tension because you never know. You never know if you're going to get that one more action. And, and and that's where I love that form of tension now that I know it. Mm-hmm. But when I'm playing with a bunch of um, experts at the game who are just like, ha, 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 blah, you did terrible because you didn't see that coming. I, it stank. It was not fun. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the fun ones, I think, for tension, and this is going right back down to the complete opposite end of the scale from Scythe, is can't stop right the first the game is over the as soon as somebody gets three rows uh yep. three call th- sorry three columns on the board it's it's over done they win yep. um and who you know it's just number of columns and and if you've if you've been pushing it and you know your your last turn everyone's getting close and you decide to push it and you uh mess up and you get nothing you're you're, you're, you're you go back that you, you just you're praying for someone else to push mm-hmm. it and get that wrong dice and you know roll roll out uh and get stuck so that you have another chance yeah. to make your your thing and and that kind of tension again you know in i mean can't stop is about as light as you get uh, True. but that tension can really work in that mm-hmm. particular game uh whereas you know code names maybe not yeah <laughs> What I was saying, I, I know there there are games out there where players can trigger the end, but I I couldn't find definite examples. One of the most fascinating, but again, I think we're getting more into end game triggers, and that, like I said, that's a delineating line <laughs> that we either need to two hours to talk about both tonight, or we need two episodes. And I'm leaning towards two episodes. Is games with random ending, like a variable randomized ending. 
Um, the most recent we play is Cowboy Bebop, where you're shuffling in that card, or Pompeii, where you never know when the volcano is going to explode. But again, that's timing. That's not what happens after it explodes. Right, because when you know when that when that comes up, there's a, a set number in, in Bebop. There is a set number set, of yep. actions that that have to occur before he yes. leaves or is defeated, and it's done. And but uh, again, you got player agency there because he only moves and if you hit him, right? right? So there's there's a whole thing there. But again, that's triggers, not actual end game mechanics. The end game mechanic in that game is you either defeat the guy and it ends immediately, or he escapes and it ends immediately. Right. Getting getting back to the topic on hand. But again, it'll be interesting control, to see. If... But again, you have control over that ending, yes. which is nice. So the entire table, it's very clear to everyone. Okay, if he's got attacks in his hand, we can defeat him this turn. Or yeah. if you have attacks in your hand, please don't hit him because he's going to leave yeah. this turn if you can't hit him hard enough. Um, so there's that. There's definitely you know, you know player agency in the the number of turns left. You can you can ask someone to not hit him. Uh, to you know, push that game uh, into another round. All right, I I think I, I haven't seen any pop up from the chat. We haven't actually mentioned yet. Now, gotta say, there aren't a lot, nope. really. Like there aren't a lot of different ways. What you do once the game ends, that doesn't change. Triggering the game end, like I said, whole of the topic. We could go on for hours, but what happens when that trigger hits? I, I, we seem to have covered them all and I'm sure we're missing some. Yeah. I, I keep thinking of other games and then I'm like, Nope, that's a trigger. Uh, yep. I'm like, no, what about this one ends, but Nope, that's a trigger too. Yeah. Um, like even but as, as like the for the actual life, ending like of the two game, different end paths. Um, so, so I, I got to bring up Arboretum. The only thing you're, it, it ends like a normal game unless you tie. Then the game ends in 10 years. You plant a tree then you go see whose tree is the tallest. So you want to see the most unique. Now, is that a trigger? That might be a trigger too. Well, no, the game's over. Playing... No, because the game's over. The game has ended. Um, that's a scoring mechanism, really. Yeah, is it though? Um, the game's not over until you... I don't think there's there's a totally different topic. Is the game over until you've determined who's won? I don't think it's over for 10 no, no, years. Absolutely. The game is over. The game is over. The scoring phase continues. Nah, to me, a game's not done until you know who won. No, see that that's the, the end game of the game and the scoring phase. Not always are, are not always, but can be separate aspects of the experience. Nah, I uh, disagree on that one. You're not, I think the game doesn't end until you, until you've calculated the final score and determined who the winner is. See, I don't, I don't find math a game. <laughs> I D, well, D, D, you, you don't like Rainier Ninzia games at all. Then. <laughs> D, D will disagree with me. I, um, but no, I mean, adding up your, your totals, to me, isn't part of the game. That's after the game. Well, we're about to review story. a game where that's definitely part of the game. Uh, well, yes, that and that's different, though. That, right? that's, How is that different? Well, I, because it is part of the game. So uh, when's that game end? Once you picked your six cards, the game's done? In, in, the, case of, in the case of Boba Mahjong, after you have picked your, your scoring form, like with the way, the way you've chosen to score your, your cards. So once you pick six cards, the game's over. No, no. Well, once you've chosen how you are going to score them. Well, that's it. No, you pick the six cards. Then yeah. you score. Everyone scores the same after that. Right. The, your decision is pick six cards. Anyway, this sounds like a lobby discussion more, but <laughs> I, I, I do not agree with Sean on this one. I know we usually agree a lot on this show. I do not agree. I don't think a game is over. It's just like the in this in, in, in with politics. The election's not over the end of the votes and the tally. It's it's in the end when they're actually sworn in. That's when the election's over, not just at the end of counting the votes. I would say the election's over when no one can vote anymore. Yeah, see? No, I don't <laughs> think so. It's uh, not over till till an official phase moves on, but the election <laughs> ends at whatever time. There we go. Blah blah blah. Cool. Let's All right. Well, at this th point, I think <laughs> we've reached the end of the round, and that means it's time to wrap things up. Though so our lobby here on turn on Twitch gets one more turn to share their thoughts on end of game mechanisms. Now, before we check in with them, just a reminder: we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can send us questions by clicking on Ask the Bellhop over at tabletopbellhop.com. You can send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can hit me up on socials, which I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. 
Welcome to our review of Boba Mahjong, a two-player only set collection card game. Before we get to the review, we need to take a moment to thank Sunrise Tornado for sending us a review copy of this game. So Boba Mahjong is a two-player only set collection card game designed by Tate Wu that features cute artwork from Holly Chu, better known online as Tiny Halls. It ends up that this game is part of a series of Mahjong-based games that started with Tian Jie Q in 2009. This was re-implemented into The Battle of Red Cliffs, a 1 to 9 version, uh, player version, which Tate Wu designed along with E.R. Burgess. Finally, the game was converted back to a two-player game in its current form of Boba Mahjong. Besides changes to player count, the mechanisms in the game have also changed with each iteration. And I've got to admit, I did not realize this game had that much of a pedigree and heritage before getting to writing up the review. Now, a game of Boba Majan takes about half an hour, and it's recommended for ages 10 plus, which I got to say seems a little higher than it needs to be. The concepts here aren't that complex, and there's no reading required. Now, the game originally funded on Kickstarter in 2022, taking two tries to get funded, and was delivered to backers the same year. It is being published by Sunray's Tornado Game Studio, who we know for their trick-taking card game, Macaron, which we previewed back in November of 2020. Now, you should be able to find ba Boba Mahjong. I don't know what I was going to say there. You should be able to find Boba Mahjong at some local game stores, direct from Sunrise Tornado, or online at stores like Amazon and Game Nerds, where it seems to have a list priced of $11.99 US, which seems pretty reasonable. Now, for a look at what you get with this two-player rummy-style game, check out our Boba Mahjong unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Boba Mahjong comes in a small card box that's just barely larger than the size of the deck that holds all the cards and a very folded up set of instructions. These instructions actually fold out to a full 8.5 by 11 two-sided standard page with clear rules and lots of examples, especially when it comes to final scoring, which is the most complicated part of the game. The cards in Boba Mahjong are of solid quality and just a little bit slippery. They reminded us of print-on-demand style cards from sites like drive Through Cards. And I've got to say, shuffling them many, many times now, they feel great. They've actually loosened up a bit, and they don't seem to be getting damaged at all. Now, the artwork here is very cute, featuring these happy little boba bubbles um, with a number of bubbles matching the number of cards, as well as some full drinks and some artistically drawn toppings. Now, the card number and icon matching the suits is present in opposite corners, which is a bonus, though the text descriptions are not reversed. Yeah, this was a problem for me the first time playing, in particular, the wild card. Yeah. Now, in total, you get cards numbered 0 to 8 in four different suits, as well as 17 topping cards. Along with that, there are two two-sided reference cards. I was happy with the component quality here, uh, especially given the low price point of the game. And I got to say, it was nice to see a card game that wasn't stored in a great big box that's filled with mostly air. Now, it's possibly going to be harder to show it off on the shelf. As you'll notice behind Mo, for those <laughs> watching, it doesn't really stand out, even though it is there on the shelf behind him. Well, now that you know what you get and where this game is coming from, time to move on to an overview of play. So you start by shuffling the deck and creating what's called the mixing pile. This is made of three face-up cards that can't be zeros at the start of the game. Each player then gets a hand of five cards and the deck is placed by the mixing pile where it's now called the supply deck. The player who most recently had a boba drink or the player who last lost a game of boba mahjong becomes the start player. So if you don't drink boba and have never played the game before, you never get to play ever. Pack it up, return it to the store. You just got to make sure someone in your group has done one of those things. So <laughs> on your turn, you start by drawing. Take one of the face-up cards from the mixing pile or two random cards from the supply deck. <laughs> Next, you can draw again, taking one face-up or two random cards. Or you can create up to three sets using the cards in your hands and the mixing piles. Now, a set is made by using exactly three cards either three cards from your hand or two cards from your hand and one from the mixing pile. These cards can be made either of the same matching number or three sequential numbers or three toppings. Now the toppings can be of any type. Note that suit color does not matter when making sets that only comes into play during end game scoring. Mm -hmm. 
Now, from your completed set of cards, you're going to pick one of those cards to set aside, which you're going to save for final scoring. You're then going to discard the other two cards. These go into the mixing pile in any order on any stack in any order. So you could put two cards together on top of each other or split them up. After drawing twice or creating up to three sets, you must either discard down to seven cards or draw three if your hand is empty. Mm -hmm. You then activate any topping cards you put aside this turn. Each of these allows you to break the rules in some way, with things like drawing extra cards, sifting through the mixing pile, or forcing your opponent to discard cards and more. Now, during all this, zero cards are special. They count as a wild card when making a set and can be used as any number. If this carded after making a set, instead of going in the mixing pile, they're removed from the game. Now, if you do save one for scoring, it counts as the number zero now. The game continues going back and forth until one player sets aside their 10th scoring card. The other player gets one more turn, and final scoring starts with the players picking six of their scoring cards to count for final scoring. An interesting thing to note that came up today is if the player who triggered the end loses one of those scoring cards, the game still ends. It doesn't get continued one more round. Once the trigger is hit, you do finish the game. Now, points are awarded for a bunch of different things. Sets of matching numbers, just like when you're making sets. Straights, regardless of color. Matching colors, where the numbers don't matter. The variety of different colors, as well as pairs of ingredients. Now, again, you just need two ingredients. They don't have to be the same ingredient. No, ingredients are not the sets. There's a different type of card. Now, what's important to note here is that the same card can be used in multiple categories. All cards are used when evaluating each criteria, colors, sets, straights, etc. A little bit like scoring cribbage in that way. Yep. Uh, the player with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, or tie, players get to use all of their set-aside scoring cards to score. If there's still a tie, then the player with the fewest set-aside scoring cards wins. If you somehow still tie, you share the victory. In particular, I love the one with the person who collected the fewest cards, so you had the less, least options, is the one that wins that tie. I dig that. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Game's pretty quick to learn. It's fast to play. And I gotta say, it's worth playing a couple games in a row and totaling your points between all games in case someone got a lucky hand or whatever. So you play two, three times and then add up all your scores between all the games, see who's the overall winner. With that, let's move on to what we thought of this two-player Mahjong game. So personally, I'm always on the lookout for a good two-player game. I love playing two-player games with my wife as well as some of my friends. It's one of our favorite ways for my wife and I to spend an evening and I dig having them on hand for bigger board game nights where it's easier to split groups of people off playing different games. So if you have six players, you don't have a six player game while two people can go play Balba Mahjong while the other four can go play a four player game. Now, in particular, though, for my wife and I, we like two player games that are highly portable so we can toss it in my wife's purse or in the glove box of the van and games that don't take up a lot of table space. And those are great for bringing to a cafe, coffee shop, pub or brewery. And Boba Mejong fits all of that criteria. Quick to learn, simple to play, but difficult to master set collection game that has really impressed me. Right. With that small footprint and very portable, it's still, while about the size of a deck of cards, has more single game depth than a deck of cards. So as much as people will say, oh, just throw a deck of cards in there, you can get a lot of different games, but you can't necessarily get one game with the kind of depth you get mm -hmm. from this one deck of cards especially with two players. That's the thing that really shines. Like, yes, there's a lot of great four-player card games. There's not a lot of great two-player ones. Unless you got a cribbage board as well. There you go. The cribbage board's way bigger than this deck. Though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, what I enjoyed the most at first was the system for saving one card out of every set made for scoring. This immediately made me think of Point Salad, and I like this. This isn't quite the same, though, because you're not changing the scoring criteria Rather, you're selecting cards that are used to fulfill the criteria that's standard for both players. This ends up adding what's basically a tableau building element to what otherwise would just be a game of rummy. Right, and the choice of what you keep is often as much about what you put back, knowing mm -hmm. that your opponent may make use of those cards that you're discarding back into the mixing bowl. Yes, that is the next awesome part of this game. 
the mixing bowl, the mixing pile system is awesome. The cleverness of this mechanism really isn't obvious until you play a couple rounds, or at least till the end of the first game. Both the fact you can make sets using a card from the pile, as well as your hands, and perhaps more importantly, the fact you all your discards go into this pile is what really makes this game work. This system can lead to some really rewarding combos, where you make a set of cards out of your hand, then use one of those discarded cards to make another set, and then use a card from that second set to complete a third set. And I gotta say, that's the most rewarding thing in this game, is pulling off three sets in one turn. So if you're making Boba at home, throwing all your leftover ingredients into one bowl and then scooping some out is probably not the most appetizing way. Probably not. (laughs) So this was the big brain moment for me. Understanding this engine that you could really, that you could build really took the game from game from, oh, yay, it's Rummy set collection to, oh, this is a cool game. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And actually, I think the theme fits here because you are just kind of throwing stuff. And then at the end, you're picking out the six ingredients that work. So I think you might just be mixing everything in the one bowl. Now, while there is a lot to like, there were some aspects of the game I didn't love. And these, every one of them revolves around the scoring system. Now, the biggest problem is picking the six cards to score out of a set of most 10. Uh, Technically, I guess it could be more. It could be 13, could it not? No, it could be 12. Because the game trigger would be on that 10th and you could do three full sets in that turn. So you might be doing 13 different cards to pick from six can lead to massive analysis paralysis. Like not not just a little bit. And this is even from players who aren't usually prone to overthinking. It. Because once you get to that end, it's all math. I've actually had games of this where picking what cards to score and adding them up took longer than playing a round of the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, But I will actually add another issue, and that is the cards themselves. These are a very cute design, but I did notice uh, after looking at them, I decided, hold on a second, I should bring these into our colorblind simulator that we use. Uh, And I did see some potential issues Mm -hmm. there. Again, we aren't colorblind, and I only have a simulator to go from, but it's worth noting that you should take a look if you are concerned there may be potential issues. Uh, But more than that, they aren't universally invertible. Uh, Mm -hmm. So the number and the symbol are in the corner, but some of the other information on those cards isn't there. Uh, And in most notably, the wild cards. Don't say wild card if you splay your hand in a normal poker style. Um, And as well, the toppings are all the same on the uh, the edges and corners, um, and are also non-invertible if you actually look at the card. So until you're used to it, like I, I didn't know at first, you know, we'd done a quick, quick little teach, but we hadn't gone through everything. We just wanted to get down and play. So I knew there was a zero and yeah, obviously there's going to be something special about a zero card, but the fact that it was a wild card while it said it on the card, I didn't see that mm-hmm. because it was hidden in my cards play. See, I think that's totally fair, though. I got to say with the zeros, that's a one-time mistake. Once you know zeros are wild, that one's not that bad. The toppings are hard. I don't know what they could have done otherwise because they have detailed rule text on them. So I don't know if maybe they could have come up with some icons well, to represent just, yeah, draw cards. It just have been the different, the picture of the different things. And you, yeah, fine. You, yeah. Have to, you have to remember what the text is or, or look at it. But having when you do your poker split, your hand, you know, when you hold out yep. your hand, you can see that there is a difference between this and this. Yes. Yeah, I don't think you can really splay the ingredients. When I play the game, the ingredients go on top and I splay the rest of my cards yeah. just because they're used differently. But I totally get the complaint. Now, the other issue I found with scoring is that the it just wasn't varied enough. The various categories all scored similar points where like um, three of the same color would be worth the same as a three straight. And I noticed various different scoring combinations yielded the exact same point total. Now, I'm assuming this was probably done for balance so that one particular type of set wasn't more valuable than another, which would lead to everyone trying to collect only that type of set. But there was just something about sitting there trying different combinations and getting the same total that just felt off. Like, let's try three of a kind with a run of three. Okay, that gets me X. Okay, how about instead I do a pair and a run of four? Oh, X. Okay, what about two runs of three? No, that's also X. And and there are some little variations there. It's not like you're always going to get the same score, 
but it just, it felt off. And I don't know if it was wrong. Yeah. And this is why, and I hadn't actually thought of this until we were sitting here talking about this today, but this is where that cribbage idea comes from. It's, you know, 15, one, 15, two, 15, three, 15, three, 21, you know, and you're just doing, going through that same thing. The strange part and the, the big difference again from cribbage is the fact that you have to pick the set of scoring cards. Yes. You're not just scoring all of the, the cards you have. Yeah. Um, and so I know my first game, I went, one way I said, okay, well, this is what I'm going to score. And then we sort of analyzed it and looked at other options. And what if I'd actually grab this one card over here instead of this card here. And I, personally, I prefer my optimization to be during the game and not in post game scoring, going back to a discussion we yes. had earlier. John prefers to actually optimize his play during the game, not after. Now my final concern about this game and note this is a concern this is not necessarily a problem is that it's starting to feel a little samey after multiple plays especially if you play a lot in a row and i've got to say it's 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 hard to complain about this because i will admit one game doesn't feel like enough like once i play once i always kind of feel like let's play a second round especially when teaching someone you need two rounds of this to fully grok how to play um but then this isn't something i don't, I don't want to sit down and play Boba Mahjong night. I don't want to sit there for an entire evening playing round after round after round. That said, with time between plays, and it doesn't have to be weeks or months, I'm totally willing to pick it back up. I just, I don't want to hit this game too often in one day. And for my wife, I don't think, like, for our vacation trips or going out to Jack's on the weekend, I'm not going to just pack Boba Mahjong. But I'll totally bring it along with a copy of the Duke and Patchwork to be part of the mix that we use on our game nights. Maybe as a uh, palate cleanser after a few games of point salad. Yeah, totally legit. So overall, I really enjoyed my plays of Boba Mahjong. This is a really solid two-player implementation of classic set collection mechanisms from games like Mahjong and Rummy. The scoring system's unique and engaging, as is the neat ability to use face-up discards when making sets and the way that discard pile is managed. I'm glad to have Boba Mahjong in my toolbox of two-player games. Perfect for playing with friends and family, as well as being a great date night game for at least my wife and I. This seems like a great game for anyone who's a Rummy fan. Rummy of any form, really, from the traditional card game to games like Rummy Cub and all the various versions of Mahjong out there. You get to all the fun making the sets, but don't need a bunch of players mm -hmm. or a bunch of time to play. Now, due to using traditional set collection mechanics, I also think this game would be a good game for non-gamers, especially fans of traditional card games. Now, where I think Balba Mahjong is going to be a hard sell are gamers who like heavier, longer games. Euro gamers aren't going to find enough uh, mechanics here, enough meat, and Amera fans are going to find there's just no real theme integration here. Like, yeah, okay, I guess it's a mixing bowl, and I guess I'm picking six ingredients to go in my cup but come on it's it's about as pasted on as you can get though i can see some abstract fantasy uh, fantasy abstract fantasy games what is that now i want to know abstract strategy game fans enjoying the scoring system in particular that whole selecting at the end does kind of have a trying to outplay your opponent and especially when you notice your opponent's trying to go for a one for one to six and you keep all the fours right i think i think the chess player types are going to dig that Though I do think that scoring system might be the one possible thing that fends off some of those traditional non-gamers, yeah. uh, traditional card gamers. I but indeed, this is very light, aside from that scoring, which, again, isn't all that bad. It depends on how competitive you're going to be. <laughs> uh, but if that lightness isn't a deal breaker, go for it. So that's it for our look at Boba Mahjong, a two-player only set collection card game from Tate Wu, who seems to be on a mission to modernize as many traditional card game mechanics as they can. And all the power to them. I hope you enjoyed this review. I invite you to also check out the written version over at tabletopbellhop.com. And if you appreciate the work that goes into these, consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Join us as we return to Valeria in this review of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Thank you, Daily Magic Games, for sending us a copy of this game, as well as thanks uh, as a thanks for helping them with their Kickstarter.
If us talking about Shadow Kings of Valyria seems at all familiar, uh, thank you for being around long enough. That's because we did preview Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria back in June of 2020. Back then, Daily Magic Games sent us what was very clearly a prototype copy of the game with unfinished in components and rules in prep for their Kickstarter launch. And you can find that preview on the blog, on YouTube, and 100 episodes ago as part <laughs> of episode 96 on our podcast, Feeling the Heat. It does not feel like it was that long ago. Back then, Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria was a big hit for us, and I had high hopes for the Kickstarter, which did go on to successfully fund the first time around. Now, quite a few months later, a package showed up with my production copy of the game, along with its expansion. Shortly after that, we published an unboxing video and went on to play the game a number of times. From there, we fully planned to review uh, um, the sh and show both on our podcast, in here, on the blog, everywhere. But there was a problem. It sold out. You couldn't find a copy of the game anywhere. Now that's changed. Not only is a second printing out there in hobby game stores and online, Daily Magic Games currently, as of this episode being recorded, has a Kickstarter running that includes a third printing of the game along with a new expansion. Now, unfortunately for those of you listening at home, it will have ended. There are 40 or so hours left at this point right now. I was hoping to get this out there, but at least for those of you listening live, there are Kickstarter is running now, but knowing Daily Magic, I'm sure there will be some way to late pledge. Now that the game is actually available, we thought it was about time to actually get a formal review of the production copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria out there. So Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria was designed by Stan Kordoniski. I think that's how that's pronounced. I might be a bit off. There's a weird ending. S-K-A-I-Y. Stan Kordonsky, Kordonsky, Kordonsky. We'll try again. That was designed by Stan Kordonsky and features fantastic artwork by the Miko. It was originally published in 2021 by Daily Magic Games after a successful Kickstarter in 2020. As mentioned, it is currently in its second printing and has a third printing on the way in 2023. This engine building game plays one to five players with games taking about half an hour solo to under two hours for the full player count. Now, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria is a dice drafting, engine building, worker placement game set in the world of Valeria. In this game, the players take on the role of the baddies who are attacking the kingdom of Valeria. Each player controls a different competing faction, moving their warden around the board, collecting troops, magic, gems, champions, and battle plans which they use to launch attacks on the Kingdom of Valeria. For a look at the components in this dice drafting game, check out our Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube. Note, Mokra also cracks open Rise of Titans expansion, which was included with the Kickstarter for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. We'll be covering that expansion in a separate review. Now, what surprised me most when cracking open the finished production version of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria was actually how little changed. Yes, physically the components were way better. The board wasn't foam core and the cards weren't sleeve cut sheets of printer paper, for example, but the actual graphic design was pretty much identical to the prototypes we got. The components here are top of the line. You get silkscreen warden and scoring meeples with each faction having its own unique shape, lots of silkscreen custom dice, thick, easy to read player boards, a very clear main board with great iconography, high quality cards. I only had two disappointments in regards to the components in Shadow Kingdoms of the Valeria. The first is that the plastic tiddly wink like chips that were in the prototype were replaced by cardboard tokens. These round tokens do look better, I gotta say, even when they feature faction symbol on them, so it's very clear to see whose is whose. I was actually kind of hoping for some clear chips where you could see what was underneath once placed. Which would be nice, but would have likely made for a price point infeasible. Totally fair. Now, the second, though, and this one's a bigger complaint, is the back of the award cards. It took me a while to even notice they're different from each other. I'm not sure why this wasn't made as clear as day. Like, it's a back of a card that you don't see once you start playing. But you have to sort these cards by their backs at the beginning of play to get things set up. It's actually become a running joke with my group to hand any new player this deck and ask them to sort them while I'm teaching the game and see how long it takes for them to notice the difference between the cards and properly sort them. 
Overall, though, component-wise, this game is great-looking, features excellent graphic design that actually helps during gameplay. Well, next up, let's move on to a short overview of play. So one thing that didn't change at all from the prototype is how Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria plays. So we're going to make this very quick and very high level. For a more in-depth overview, go back to the preview we mentioned earlier, either on the blog, YouTube, or on episode 96. So to play Shadow Kings of Valeria, you're each going to choose a faction, take all the components for that faction, set up your player board with starting gold and magic, and cover all the upgrade spots with conquest tokens, which are now cardboard. You also grab a random campaign map, pick which side to use, and put it next to your player board. Each of the five sections of the main board are seeded with dice. Gems and cards, including award cards, battle plans, and champions are placed on their spots on the map, and the game is ready to start. Now, each turn, players are going to take their warden and move it to a different spot from where they grabbed it from, either one of the five regions on the map or back on their player board in order to launch an attack. When a warden is placed on the board, the player will draft one of the dice from that region and then do the action associated with that region. The neat part here is the reward value of that action is based on the die value taken. Higher numbered dice provide better troops, which are needed for battles, but provide less awards which honestly is one of the most brilliant parts of this game. Now, board actions include collecting gems that let you flip dice, hiring champions, each of which has either an instant reward or ongoing ability or endgame scoring opportunity, earning gold, used to pay for champions and battle plans, claiming awards, or gathering magic, which can be used to cycle the various card decks in play as well as improve drafted dice, or collecting battle plans. Now, once you have a battle plan and enough dice matching the troop types on that plan, you can launch an attack on Valeria. You do this by moving your warden to your player board and selecting which dice will fight. The values of the dice are totaled, any modifiers are applied, and you get victory points for how high the dice total is. After each battle, you then get to level up in a way by removing one of those campaign tokens from your board, which unlocks more options. You're then going to place it onto your campaign map, which can also award you bonuses for placing them next to other ones. So the game continues until a player competes their seventh battle, in which you finish the round and the player with the most victory points wins. Now, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria also includes a solo mode where you pick a faction and compete against an AI adversary. Well, now that we've re reminded you of how the game plays, let's move on to how we feel about this game now, over two years later, and having the production version in hand. So remembering when we first got this game and looking back at the preview and rereading in the blog, I got to say we were all seemed pretty smitten with this game at the time, and we were clearly eagerly awaiting to see what its final form would be like. And it turns out, not that much different than its preview form. Oh. Yay! Yeah, except for... Physical component improvements and a better written rule book. This is exactly the same game we played two years ago uh, multiple times. Now, one of the things I appreciated then is how different this game felt from other Valeria games. Today, that's not as much the case as this game seems to have opened the doors for new types of games in the Valeria series. Just last week, we played a Valeria trick-taking game in the form of Thrones of Valeria. When we played a Valeria roll-and-write game in the form of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. I, I, you really can't think of Valeria as a bunch of card-driven engine builders anymore, and I think this was the game that kind of changed that and bridged that gap. Though I do think this game, unlike, for instance, Thrones of Valeria, still feels like a relative of the original game. Yeah, it's it's a closer tie, but it it still needs what what's missing to me is the roll two dice to generate something. That that to me is the core of Valeria that didn't come in this game, but that's part of the game. You have to realize this isn't just another version of Card Kingdoms. Now, one of the things that is still unique about this game, as far as I can tell, there are, I have not played all the Valeria games anymore. At one point I had um is that flip of playing the bad guys, being the the monsters. So far, as far as I know, this is the only Valeria game where you play the monsters and not the defenders. And I've got to say, I, I do appreciate that theme shift. And while they could have just flipped the original, made it the same game, but from the opposing viewpoint, I like that they didn't and took a mm -hmm. different tact for how the villains go about their attacks on Valeria. I also still love the dice mechanisms of this game. I love the way that higher numbered dice are useful 
if not required to score well during battles, but they give you little to no reward when taking actions with them. This leads to some really interesting decision points, and you'll often find yourself being forced to draft a low number die just because you need the gold or you really want to buy a high cost champion. What's neat though is later in the game, after you've unlocked more ways to modify the dice by winning battles, you it's not so bad. Uh, you can draft a one. Actually, ones become way better because a single gem will flip that over to a six when your troops are ready to attack. Yeah, planning and mitigation are your friends. Laying that strong base as you go for later in the game is vital. Now, my biggest disappointment in this game, which is something I complained about two years ago and I'm not going to stop complaining about with the production copy, is a lack of asymmetry. The fight, despite the fact it sounds like an asymmetric game, you're picking different factions, there's orcs and gargoyles and goblins and different and gnolls and all these different armies to pick from, it's not actually asymmetric. The only difference between these factions, besides their color and their meeple, is that each has a power that you do have to unlock that lets you use a different colored die as wild. I don't consider that asymmetric. It was really hoping that the final version of the game would have some kind of bonus that was different for each faction. This was something we reported, and I know other reviewers reported when trying the prototype, but they did not act on it. And we all know your love of asymmetry. Well, yeah. But not everyone is maybe as eager for that. And importantly, it's not easy to differentiate and maintain a game balance. So they made a call on this one and chose balance. Yeah, I think also simplicity. The fact that you don't have to learn how to play different factions differently is also part of it. Yes, I love asymmetry and I would have liked it. Optional rule. That's all you need is optional rule. Now, the other problem I found with this game, and this only exists because I've been playing it for two years because the game's that good. It still hits my table regularly, is that it does start to feel a bit the same. And I think that lack of asymmetry might be part of this problem. Every faction does play the same. It doesn't matter which one you're playing. They're all identical. There are some gameplay trends I started to notice, especially playing with experienced players. Early in the game, everyone's going to be grabbing those fives and sixes because that's what you need. Players are going to fill their campaign board based on what award is up, which just makes sense. There's an award that gives you points for having your board filled out in a certain order. Well, of course, people are going to fill it out in that certain order. Similarly, battle plans. They're going to look at the awards. If the award is for three siege engine battles, you're probably people are going to grab the siege engine battles. And I got to say the campaign marker on influence is the first or second one to be pulled off every game I played. Now, this only actually became a problem after quite a few plays. Like, I didn't even notice this our first five plays. Um, as we've done said multiple times on the show, we try to play everything five times. When we did the preview, we played it actually more than five times. Didn't notice this at all. It's only after two years of multiple plays, we started to see it. Deanna was actually the first person to note it and was like, you know what? I'm, I, I kind of had enough of that game. It starts to feel the same. And I got to say, it took me a few games after that for me to acknowledge this as a potential problem. Know what I'm saying acknowledge, because I don't have this problem myself. I still enjoy the game. I like trying different things, but definitely have met players who are like, yeah, it's, it's good, but it always feels the same. Now, while this may be an issue for long term, there aren't many groups who are going to play a game as often and back to back as we often do for reviews. Mm -hmm. So the issue may not stand up as much to a group who's only playing it a couple of times a month or less. Totally true. So overall, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria is a very solid and enjoyable part of the Valeria universe. It was the first game of the series to do something totally different, and I do think that opened up the door for more game types with the Valeria name on it, and I have to appreciate that for this game. This is a very tight, well-balanced, dice-drafting, engine-building, worker placement game. So I personally wish so it was just that little bit more asymmetry. Do you hear that, Daily Magic? New player boards? Maybe in a Kickstarter that's live right now? Yeah, I had, so Sean Sean mentioned that, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure, and I looked it up, and sure enough, the currently live Kickstarter for the latest expansion has player board overlays, and every faction gets its own asymmetric power. So thank you, Daily Magic. But we're not talking about an expansion here, so right now, it's a minor problem in Shadow Kings of Valeria. 
If you dig into building games, honestly, I don't think you can go wrong with this one. This this isn't the heaviest one out there. It's no Vital Lacerda, but it's a nice slow build up of doing more stuff, collecting more dice to get bigger totals to score more points. If you group likes to play a mix of engine building games, this would be a great additional option. Maybe not the best game you play every week, but something great to have in the mix. If you've enjoyed other Valeria games, you'll want to check this one out. Just don't expect another card-driven resource management tableau builder. This is a very different style of Valeria game. Now, if you're looking for your next lifestyle game, something you get together and play every weekend or play six times in one night, you may want to avoid this one, at least without the forthcoming expansion. Gameplay in Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria can start to feel repetitive, though it does take a lot of plays to get there. And I will say, based on what it seems like the average trend in board games, most players and groups won't get there. But I do know there are people out there that get their lifestyle games and play them over and over. Not sure this would be the best choice for you. Personally, I am so glad we chose to preview this game two years ago. And I'm glad that it's finally back in print and it's available to more gamers so they can discover this game for the first time. I, I'm glad we were able to talk about it and finally got this review done and, and can share the Valeria love. I look forward to checking out the existing expansion next. That's that's next on my list is to try that out. And then perhaps the newly funded one coming out later this year. Well, that wraps up our return to Valeria. I hope you enjoyed the ride. If you've played this game or other games in the Valeria series, we'd love to hear your thoughts on some of those games in the comments. Now, besides the time taking the time to check out our original preview, I did write up a written version of this review over at tabletopbellhop.com, and I welcome you to check that out as well. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Okay, so we got a few things to cover here. It was a big gaming weekend, which was pretty awesome. Lots of games, most games of the year so far, which is probably going to be true for a large period of time. <laughs> so the first thing that happened is we totally didn't have a Sean Con. Nope, Sean came no over, time. Sean came over, and we spent the all day hanging out and playing games, but not a Sean Con, nope, not at all. Not a Sean Con. <laughs> first game was Drop It. Um, This we first played back at Queen City Conquest 2017, 2018, maybe in 2016. I think it was 17? I think it was the first one. Might no, have been 2017. You went to one, then I went to one, then you went to another one, then you went to the one at the university that I didn't go to. So I think this was pandemic. 20... So it must have been the... It was 17 or 18. I can't even remember. Anyway, well, long 19, time ago at this yeah, point, like five, 17, because in 18, you went 19. We couldn't go because no, no, yeah. 19. I think we went because I went to origins in 19. I, I don't know. Track. I don't know. Yeah. I don't even know when all this started again. Quarantine years, years, ago. years. <laughs> anyway, it was like five years ago. Anyway, we, we played this game and it was one of the play and take. I can never remember the, the fancy term they had for that, but like play to win or whatever where you play the games and you might take a copy home and, and Sean and D grabbed me after some event. And we're like, you got to try this game. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I've been looking forward to that. And we played it and it was awesome. Well, I'm, um, I'm pleased to say it took five years to get a copy. I do have to thank uh, my in-laws for a copy of the game. So that was awesome. Thank you very much. Ollie and Brenda. Um, it's as good as ever. Like, like, I don't know why this game's so good. I think it's because you have to use logic, that, that you have to plan ahead, it, that there are tactics and strategy in what's a dexterity game. So it's, I don't know if it is a dexterity game, because like... It is. It's, it's a it's, mix. So, I mean, it's it's a it, mix. It's a physics simulator. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a mix of, of uh, Connect 4, but then also with like junk art. And, uh, you know, it's, it's got all these different, uh, deceptively difficult aspects to it, um, yeah. that really make it hard to play. So, so Roger Dodger is calling out chance coffee in Ford city. We went there, they have no tables. There, there's nowhere to sit to drink coffee. They're takeout only, I guess, or something. We did try that. We tried to go to chance. Yep. So yeah, drop it. Good as ever. Awesome game. Like, yeah. like honestly, it's it's really good. It's yeah. It, it's silly. You're dropping shapes and you have no idea how they're going to move until you played a few times, and then even then you're trying to pull things off. And and the reason I'm saying it's not dexterity is like your physical dexterity. It's more about where you drop. 
And we were joking about it. like maybe there's something about like you know hitting the top of a piece to get it down there with more some force English on it or putting it. some English on it or something. But it's a neat game, neat game. Um, best Tetris ever. Uh, next up was Thrones of Valeria. Kind of going back to our earlier review, this is a trick-taking game. In the Valeria universe, plays six players, which is a huge bonus for a trick-taking game for me. Uh, the neat thing here is you have, I think it's five suits, and you randomly determine the rank of them. They represent five guilds or something. Again, it's a trick-taking game. You can't really thematically do a good trick-taking game. So you have five suits randomly determine their rank and the whole thing here is a higher rank trumps a lower rank which is huge um in in gameplay now the other neat thing here is every rank is assigned a point value from or a coin value of minus three to five points and whoever takes the trick whatever suit they use that's how much money they get and note that money could be lose three and the neat bit is you only play for point the the money like it doesn't you could theoretically win this game without ever taking a trick which i I don't think it'd be easy but like it's not about taking every trick it's all about doing interesting now the part i hadn't mentioned yet is every single card modifies something so you can steal coins from other players you can rearrange the 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 guilds you can assassinate a guild moving it to the bottom of the track and you can draw cards from the discard pile to improve your hand there's all these funky things going on as well really really neat trick taking game so it's a fantastic game um there are a couple of uh comments we're going to have in the review on the art uh of mm-hmm. it uh, which is interesting but my problem with it is while i again i really enjoyed this game it was fantastic every time we played it I, it doesn't feel like valeria no they they slap the valeria label on it on a on a great game but I, it, it nothing absolutely nothing nothing about this game from the art on feels like valeria like why aren't the suits the four citizen types from valeria like i i'm I'm kind of baffled by this as well yeah like we talk about card games having pasted on themes but they didn't even paste on the theme (laughs) they didn't even try to paste it on right (laughs) yeah and like red cards aren't strength and blue cards aren't magic like if they had just kind of thrown that in some way like like valeria one of the things i like about their small games is that they've kind of stuck with the blue is magic with combos with something else to do something cool and strength is for fighting things. All that's gone. This is just a, a very well done trick taking game that happens to have a Valeria theme. Yeah. Well, no, not even a theme, just a name. It's got and, a yeah, name. Fair. Um that's it. maybe, maybe the card are, are dukes from the game, and I didn't catch that. Mm. Maybe. Uh, I think that's I might be giving them too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> Again, great game though. Great trick taking game. Oh, this one's up there. Our friend, our, our friend Glenn, Glenn, um, I'm getting the name, Dan McDonald. Sorry, our friend Dan McDonald from Brains on Games has played the game 50 times. <laughs> it's not in retail yet, or it's just hitting retail. I, I don't know which. This is was a Kickstarter game. 50 times a trick taking. He said, I can't play anything else. Anytime my friends come over to play or family comes over to play, that's what they ask. Like, can we play that? Can we play that Thrones game? Can we play that Thrones card game? And I'm like, man, and then that's someone who plays a lot of games. Yep. All right, next is Dolce. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It is a game about building confectionaries um, that, man, threw me for a loop because I read the rule book and I was like, this sounds way too simple. Like, I think I'm going to play this with the kids. I, I was expecting more of a Euro engine builder. And and it's just like you get a card, you decide what to do with it. It's, it's a bingo system. So we, one player shuffles her deck and draws a card and goes, I have card 13. So everyone else finds their card 13 and does something with it. I actually love that mechanic. I love games where everyone has the same input. And sure enough, in our game, our end was so completely different from each other. And I love that because we all had the exact same input. Um, but no, this is a heavy, thinky engine builder, a, a rather difficult one. And holy cow, engine in the fact that you literally like run an engine where you make a confection that creates byproducts that can be used in another confection that also could potentially use make byproducts that could be used in a third convection. And if you don't get to use the, the, the byproducts, you feed them to your chicken and your chicken will produce you eggs, which can be used as wild cards. Like, like even just saying that it's convoluted. Yeah. It's really convoluted. What I have to say, and, and, and D and I both made this same mistake. 
Uh, as you do when you're setting up a game for a first time teach, one of the things you do is if there are player aids or reference cards, you pass them out. Yep. And then, you know, and, and so go about setting up the, card, the the game. Well, Mo passed out these reference cards before we'd done any talk, could teach, because he was setting up, uh, setting up the game. And D and I, being the players that we are, grabbed the cards and read, read them to try and get a mm -hmm. feel for the game. Well, we got completely confused yeah. by these reference cards. They got our ideas of the game all out of whack, and it made teaching the game for Mo that much more difficult yeah. because we had incorrect understandings mm -hmm. before we'd ever played the game. So yeah, I was sitting there like, where are you getting rate? this from? <laughs> I remember asking, where yeah. are you getting this from? I'm like, I didn't teach that. Where are you getting this from? See, I hadn't even looked at the player aid. I just expect player aids to be at least somewhat decent at yeah. teaching games or at least referencing the stuff so people can be like, oh, that's what Mo just said. I had never looked at them. Which yeah, so, I mean, I guess if you, know the game, to me, if you know the game, I think they're probably fine, but don't let first-time players look yeah. at the player aids, which is something I never thought I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to say longer, too. I, I wouldn't say overstate its welcome because what well, was yeah. our first game and we were learning, but it was way longer than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be more of a filler and it's not. No. And there's a couple of things on card layouts. Again, when we review this there, we're going to have some thoughts. Yeah. I, I think there are some, some concerns with the game, but overall it, it was fun once we sort of got past the, yeah. the confusion. No one play at this point. So yeah. most Just of these are our first plays. So who knows? Maybe in four more plays, we'll be like, no, oh, it's amazing or oh, it's terrible. So I got to say, just to go with the, the follow up on Sean, there is what is with making the art so prominent on cards? Give me the information I need to play, especially when the art's all the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like if you're going to make the art prominent, do something with it. <laughs> anyway, enough about that one. Uh, next was Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. This was the most Valeria game out of the new three small box Valeria games. Um, this was really solid. Um, probably the best roll and write I played. Again, one play at this point, so I, I can't say too much about it. Um, but this was really solid. It felt like Valeria, you're rolling a handful of six dice, two of those dice are the exact same shape and size of the dice in Valeria Card Kingdoms. You use them the exact same. You go, I have a two and a three. So my citizens that are number two, three, and five all produce resources. Though in this case, the resources are filling in pips on various parts on your sheets. You then use the other dice to do more stuff like hire more citizens um, to attack orcs or bad guys. We kept calling them orcs, but I think it's just like the bad guys. I don't know if they have specific names. We grew up the Warhammer. You're always fighting orcs. If they're bad guys and they have ears and noses, they're, they're, they're orcs. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, this one, this one was fun. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, the one thing that I think we found, um, once we figured out some of the confusion <laughs> is downtime. Uh, yeah. Valeria doesn't have a lot of that downtime. Whereas this, uh, because there was a lot of figuring things out once you, once you rolled your dice, there was, um, a good bit of options of where you could put things and, and, and I, you know, machine of that you could get going of, okay, well, I'm going to play this. I'm going to play this, which is going to trigger this, which is going to trigger this, which is going to trigger this. And where do I want to mm -hmm. spend these end resulting points I got? Um, so it ends up and everyone else is just waiting for you to finish up and pass the dice on so that they can either, you know, use their two dice or actually play their machine. Um, so that there was, a, there was definitely a downtime and it, it was, it, it went long. Yeah. Well, it was also only our first play. So, yeah, honestly, at this point, it kind of felt a little too long. But first play, I, I hate. I, I almost sometimes hate talking about a game after the first play. Yeah. Now, one thing I will point out: we did play extreme, yes. which I still haven't figured out how we played the Dolce Extreme or how we played uh, Thrones of Valeria Extreme. Dolce, I think we figured oh, out because no, we messed no, up while we were we playing. Knew. Thrones, we did figure out. Uh, oh, you well, I played it right, yeah, but I didn't knew, explain you knew, it well. You and I didn't didn't yes. understand one thing, so we didn't actually play it wrong. But our understanding shaped how That's right. we played differently than if we had understood yes. it. I, okay. I should point that out. So, so our extreme play of Thrones of Valeria was Sean and Deanna didn't realize that the rank of the cards trumped the ones like they trump the ones below. They thought just the top ranked card trumps everything, which it does. But also, if you're only playing the bottom two suits, the one above it trumps the bottom one right which matters for doing trick taking yeah. dolce i know we noticed stuff while playing like people were yeah. playing things wrong and using 
especially with the the rules for um I forgot the word I said it when we were talking products. earlier byproducts yes the byproduct rules we messed up the thing on this one was we finished the game we're sitting around we're chatting and we're like man that gold track's really long we barely touched the gold track how did how would you fill the gold track and we started counting up how many possible ways you can get gold and we came to 25 and well the track goes to 30 then we remembered there's a statue that would give you three gold and I'm like, the odds of taking that statue are really low, and it seems like a really bad way to try to get, like, one star. But that's still left two you couldn't get. And this was enough that I'm like, I reached out to the designer, and I was like, hey, Levi, um, this doesn't seem right. And even Levi didn't realize at first and was like, eh, yeah, you're right. I added it up. It doesn't work. Just give everyone two stars. And then one of the lead designers for Daily Magic was like, figured it out. They must have forgot that every time you use a red die to attack an orc, you get a gold. And I'm like, yeah, I totally, I didn't teach that rule because I totally forgot it. That's the disadvantage of Sean and D. Don't read the rules I do. And I teach it and I missed one. So that actually may change the entire speed of the game. Because more tracks are going to get filled in sooner. And on that track are other things that are going to make you fill in other things. And yep. the combos will happen more and you're going to get statues quicker. Like yep. you're probably going to get three statues by the end of the game with that. Yeah, it's so almost, that, you're almost, uh, yeah, no, a lot of things happen. Yeah, a lot. So so that's why I'm like that first play. Yeah, we learned the game. We sat down. We learned. <laughs> yep, fair enough. Last game of It's Not Sean Con because my kids came home, and then we played um, played another round of Thrones of Valeria, which is the trick-taking one, because I know people, well, Dice Kingdom is pretty obvious, which it is. Um, the other third game is a solo game, which is why we haven't played it. We haven't played Siege yet. I should go sit and play Siege. Um, and this was Thrones, and we gave the kids the option, right? Do you want to play the, the dice rolling game where we're filling in stuff with Sharpies? Or do you want to play the card game? And I'm shocked they picked the card game. I really am. That's not what I expected from them. They, they picked the card game, and this is where Sean and D realized that I fumbled my teaching of of the um, the, the, the the Trump rules. Um, and the main thing with playing with my kids, for one, my kids got it. Even my youngest, who sometimes has difficulty, she really got it. She won the game. So I guess she got it. Um, way better with five than three. So I got to say, for a three-player trick-taking game, it played fine. Yep, There was no, no problem with it, but it was better with five. Yeah, I mean, any trick-taking games are going to play better with the highest of the uh, higher of the allowed player counts. Um, because you uh, allow more variability and more strategies to mm -hmm. all intertwine. So plus harder to card count, which I did do some of in that game because it's a trick taking game. That's what you're required to do to play well. So that was it for Sean was over for the day and we don't have Sean cons anymore. So it, it was just, we, we play games on whatever day of the week that was, I think it was a Friday. It was Friday. Yeah. Know. yeah, it was on. Yeah. You said that it was Friday. So the other thing um, I got in is we did have a small gaming in the new year. I was just Dan and the kids and I, um, we started late. So we didn't get in as much gaming as we planned. Uh, we started the day doing holiday things. We made a day of it, uh, you know, kind of the big hurrah before the kids are going back to school. Um, they got some gift cards for chapters that we went to the mall. Do not go to the mall on New Year's Eve. I learned that. I would have figured New Year's Eve would be fine. But no, it was it was bad. I don't know if it was last. I, there was a whole ton of vendor year sales. Plus, people were trying to return stuff. Um, so, yeah, there was that. Don't go to the mall. But it worked. The kids bought stuff. They were happy. They got books. They got plushables, I think they call them. Um, so we were there. Um, then we took the kids to Dumpling Time for the first time, which I got to say that when I heard about that place, I feared not my kids. But now that I've been there a few times and had an idea of what they'd like. Oh, man, they loved it. Um, and I am, I'm blown away by this. So Genevieve, my youngest has declared this as better than sushi. So, mm -hmm. so she has a birthday coming up in February and she's like, nope, totally. We're, we're, we don't need to go to Nico. We got to go to dumpling time. So that was cool. Um, Gwen, she loved everything. Now I got to admit, she has a sweet tooth and I got salted egg lava buns, which are pretty sweet. And we did get the condensed milk. So I think those are the main things that won her over. Uh, but they also love the um, the onion pancakes, which I don't think we got the time you were with us. Um, Gwen was three out of five. She liked. So she was pretty good and was like, I'll totally go back and try other stuff. 
Um, we also checked out, I got to say, I'm impressed by a Cobb's Bread is in the same plaza. We stopped there to pick up uh, treats for the morning because we knew we were going to stay up late. So no one wanted to cook in the morning. So I like we got some ham and cheese croissants and stuff. Really good. So recommended Cobb's Bread across the street or across the plaza, I should say. Then we drove out to Essex and tried to hit, and I'm not even going to remember the name of it, but a small um, confectionery shop. We we tried to LARP Dolce and pick up some treats, but they were closed, which is fair. Um, my problem is it seems like the places keep their Christmas lights on even when closed because it's the holiday season, so we thought they were open. Uh, then we handed out to Auntie Aldo's, which, man, Sean, how did we not think of Auntie Aldo's? They were open till 6, but I didn't even think of it. We totally could have went out there. She now has a board game section on display for people <laughs> to play when she gets there. Now, we got there just before closing, so what we did there is we picked up some midnight treats. Um, so we did that. Uh, then we went to La Salle and went to Winter Lights, which, you know, compared to the Amherstburg River Lights, and, uh, well, the thing that's going on in Jackson Park that you can probably see from Toronto, it's, it's not that impressive. So so you don't need to rush out to La Salle to see their light show. But if you live out there, I'm sure it's something nice. Um, then we did charcuterie. That was the plan all night. And finally got to some games. Games and lights. I mean, it sounds like one of my normal days. <laughs> there you go. Though they could have used your help out in La Salle because one third <laughs> of the lights were off. <laughs> Uh, and no, no, after Christmas, you know, yeah, it's true. All right. So similar to totally not Sean Con, we started with drop it. And yes, as expected, the kids liked it, but they didn't love it. Um, we played two games, one with jokers. Um, Gwen thinks it's going to be great for her board game club at school, which that's a nice one. Like here's one that the high school kids will probably like. So that's an awesome, awesome bonus for her. Um, I thought we played like three, four five rounds of that. Uh, Genevieve was done after round two. She had just, she was done. So, okay. all right. So, yeah. Next, we didn't, uh, we didn't make. Um, oh, never mind. Sorry, I completely wrote the wrong thing there. All right. <laughs> I don't know what you were doing. There. Um, next up was our first ever play of Monstrosity. It was as good as I expected it to be. It was pretty much all it's cracked up to be. You see this game once, you know what it is, you know what it's going to be about. Totally legit. Um, it was a big hit. Um, you draw a monster card out of a deck. You have 20 seconds to memorize the card, stare at it, try to remember things. Um, a, my now thing when I teach is to point out certain things. How many arms? How many legs? How many eyes? What's the shape of the body? You're going to try to pay attention to all those things. Ignore the color because you're drawing in black and white. That's an important one. Um, then you're going to put it down and then you have a two minute timer to describe that monster that you just looked at to the other players who are sketch artists who try to draw what you're saying. And the fun part here is you're also allowed to ask questions so you can clarify. You're like, oh, wait, you said it had a, a snout, but like a dog snout or like a, a I don't know, draft snout. I don't know why that popped <laughs> in my head, but whatever. Um, neat game. Everyone gets to draw twice. The problem was the creatures are creepy. Um, Bob Everson, do not get this game. Um, Bob from the Misdirected Mart podcast has severe, severe arachnophobia. Don't get this game. The artists seem to like to mash spiders with things in particular and other creepy Oof. things with other creepy things. And there's pustules and drool and dripping things and lots of, of, um, weapon like bits, uh, swords, talons, saws. Oh, unexpected. Okay. Uh, now the weird part is it's cartoony. And I didn't have a problem with it, but the kids actually found it a bit scary. Um, like, like Gwen got a car is like, I don't want to stare at this for 20 seconds. So what I know is out there is there is an expansion called the cute creatures expansion. It's only about 10 bucks. I need to find a copy of this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my copy of monstrosity and I'm going to keep it for game nights and bring it out to the barbershop bar and playing with friends. And when I play with the kids, we'll use the cute creatures. Locally, no one has. It. I tried. I tried to shop local and 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 support local stores, but no one has this. So I, I got to find a copy of it everywhere I found that has it. Wants more for shipping than the game itself. So unless I'm going to do a massive order from 401 Games or something, so I still do need to talk to our friend Ian to see if it's something they can get in. But I didn't want to get a hold of him when he wasn't actually working, so I haven't actually followed that route yet. But no one has it in stock. So if anyone knows where to get cute creatures in Windsor, let me know. Heck, if you happen to have seen that at local calendar clubs, um, let me know and I'll go pick that up. Because I like my kids loved it, 
and not all the cards were like that. So, and I don't want to pick through because no, yeah, that kind of ruins the game. So speaking of that, uh, there are people who've complained about the lack of replayability in this game. But when you were unboxing, it, it seemed like the deck was pretty sizable. How so, fast do you think you're going to go through that deck? So 99 cards. Okay. Now, each game, everyone's going to draw twice. So depending on how big your group is. So in our game, we went through six of 99 cards. Okay. That's with three of so you us. You're to probably going to want to play it with more people, right? Right. It's a big party game. I, I don't remember how many player boards it gives you, say six. So I don't know, six. So 12 a night, you're going to get 10 game nights out of it. Less than 10, nine, less than 10, yeah. nine or eight game nights out of it, which honestly isn't a lot. No, if no, you're playing with that fair. many people. Now that said, and this is the part I've never seen anyone mention before. There are variants in the back of the rule book to use once you played through the entire deck. Oh, interesting. Added to that, there are four expansions, I think, now that each have 100 cards in them. Plus, there's a whole other printing of the game, which is the top secret edition, which welcome to the U.S., where you can get cheap versions of games at Target. That is a was a Target exclusive, already available elsewhere. Lower price point than the original, just as many cards and all unique cards that aren't in any of the other sets. So you want to pick up all the, there's robot expansion. So there's a cute creature. 500 different cards. Well, yeah, 500 different cards then. Yeah. So at, at like 10 bucks for the expansions. Plus, like I said, there is a way to play. And as Deanna pointed out, like, unless you play those 10 games in one night, <laughs> you're going to forget what the things look like. Like I did have the concern to be like, oh, remember the one that looks like a pile of poop with all the eyes? And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Like, like maybe, maybe. But, like, for the amount we play party games, like, we play some party games quite often. Even then, I don't remember. It's like, like, any time I start playing Telestrations, I never remember what side of the clue cards we started on to make sure I'm drawing new ones. And it doesn't matter because I don't remember. Right. Totally fair. So next, speaking of Telestrations, we did play four rounds. Um, once with the 12-player party pack cards, which no, do have more cards than the eight-player. So we use that set. For one round, and it was one of those we all did. We didn't mark score at all this game, which usually I do mark score in illustrations, but we didn't bother. Um, we played this side, then we played that side. And then since it was New Year's and mom and dad were playing, it was the late last game of the night. We also did two more games grabbing an 80s, 90s card, starting with 90s, then playing 80s. Um, same problem. I, I my, Our review stands about the 80s and 90s. What I said then was... Yes, it seems like a great idea. It seems hilarious. And you would think that you should be able to draw this stuff, even if you don't know what it is. Like, for example, one of the cards we had was Blockbuster that led to a hilarious moment where my child drew a brick that's cracking and a YouTube screen. Very clearly, it is a YouTube screen oh, yeah. because she was like, well, it's blocks and a video. And I'm like, that's what you do to show video. She's like, oh, yeah, everyone knows that means video. And I'm like, wow, there's a generation gap because that's it's not what I think of, though it works. So I guess it's not that big a gap. I heard drawing the play on YouTube button. I know it means video, but she wouldn't necessarily get the references I had. So it sort of works. That's right. it. Lots of games, but we're through them all. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have come planned for the coming weeks? So playing games, more games. Um, I think we're getting back together with Kat and Tori later this week. I hope so. Um, not positive though. I got to confirm that. Um, and I want to get in some gaming with the kids before they go back to school. They go back Monday. So I want to try to have, um, have sit down with them and play some games. So, um, I want to make th with the two with Tori and Kat coming over and the kids, I'm hoping to make another dent in the pile of obligation. We got two done tonight. Um, specific games I want to get played are the Disney games. You mentioned about the op. I want to play Smash Up Disney with the kids. I'd, I'd see if the kids get it, see if they grok it, see if they enjoy it, especially the youngest. I want to see how she handles it. Maybe she'll kick our butts, just like the, tri the trick-taking game. But I want to see how she handles it. Um, I want to play those new Valeria games we played with you, with Katori and Kat. Um, and maybe Rise of Titans expansion for Shadow Kingdoms to follow up on this week's second review. Now, I don't know. So, so expansions are different. I don't necessarily feel I need to play expansion five times to get it especially depending on how much it adds, but maybe I do. It totally depends on how much it adds. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think this one might be individual components, so I may need to play it multiple times to see if how they combo. So kind of like the Orleans one, Orleans, I had to try 
trade and I had to try intrigue. And then I had to try, I forget what the other one was, whatever. There were multiple ones and there was one we didn't like. And then we liked certain ones comboed and like, I need to do the work to get that. So that's on my list. I, I can't promise that we'll review that next week. I'm expecting we'll probably have a review of at least one of the small box Valeria games though by next week. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon patrons. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Sheehan. Thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr. Thank you. Brian Kurtz. Thank you. Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Zeus. Thank you. Kat and Tori eventually get to add a third name to your list as well. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop that portcullis. Well, the doors are closed. You can always find us across uh, tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Now, if you dig what we've been doing, it'd be awesome if you stop by our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and tip your bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our Pendo Suite after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.